If you've made it this far, then congratulations, you've made it to the end. This video is the last in a series about the SAP 6502 hardware, which is based on the SAP-1 from Albert Paul Malvino, but which was popularised by Ben Eder in his excellent YouTube series. Now, the SAP-1 is a great learning tool, but it doesn't really do much. It only has 16 bytes of RAM. I wanted to show in this series that with some modifications, we could make it execute 6502 machine code and potentially tap into the huge software library for the Apple II computer. I haven't turned on this machine for a while, and the dreaded thing happened. Bit rot. Although, technically I think the term bit rot's reserved for software. I've shown my errors along the way, so hopefully you guys can learn from my mistakes. But debugging under this sort of circumstance is different to regular debugging, because I know the circuit already worked once. The most probable culprits are a broken wire, a bad joint, or less likely but possible, a bad chip. The first thing to do is to perform a really detailed visual inspection. And guess what? Here it is. This wire broke loose. It's really one of the downsides of this type of construction, and once the build's complete, it should really be mounted properly. But that said, it's still probably more robust than a breadboard build. Anyway, I fixed that, and that turned out to be the problem, so that was a pretty easy solution. The last part of the machine to be built is the decimal adjustment module, and I need a way of detecting when decimal mode's working. It turns out that Pac-Man uses decimal mode for the score, and here we can see it displaying some unusual garbage symbols between 9 and 0. Bingo, I can use this to test whether decimal mode's working or not. The 6502 has dedicated hardware for performing decimal adjustment, and we can see it here at the bottom of the schematic. It's a pair of 4-bit adders. One input comes from the ALU via the special bus, but the other input to the adder is hardwired. Each nibble can either add 0, 6, or A in hexadecimal, and we'll see the significance of this later in the video. So, what is binary coded decimal? Well, let's first go over hexadecimal again. Hopefully you already know that each hexadecimal digit is made up of four bits, and there are 16 possible combinations of ones and zeros for four bits. This grouping of four bits is called a nibble. We label the first 10 combinations, zero through nine, and then we label the remaining six, A through F. A single byte, or eight bits, can take values from zero, zero to FF, which is the equivalent of 0 to 255 in decimal. In C++, we use this 0x in front of the string to indicate that it's a hexadecimal number, and I've carried over this convention here. The number displayed up the top is 17, or 17 in hexadecimal, which actually turns out to be 23 in decimal. In binary coded decimal, we still deal with 4-bit chunks at a time like we do with hexadecimal, but only the first 10 combinations of the bit patterns are valid. These take on the values 0 through 9, and the other combinations are considered to be invalid. In binary coded decimal, a byte can take a number between 0 and 99. The number here is 17, which is just plain old 17. There are only two instructions that actually make adjustments for binary coded decimal. These are add with carry and subtract with carry and there are two instructions for setting and clearing the decimal bit. We need to handle binary coded decimal differently for addition and subtraction. I'm going to go ahead and look at subtraction first, because it's actually a bit easier. If we subtract 1 from 0, then the result is minus 1, which is FF in hexadecimal from the adder. In binary coded decimal mode though, we really want this number to be 99, not FF. When we subtract 1 from the number 2, we get the answer 1, which is correct, and so we don't want our decimal adjustment hardware to do anything in this case. To change this FF to a 99, we first look at the bottom nibble, which is F, or 15 in decimal in this case, and decide whether we need to subtract 6 from this number to bring it back down to 9. It turns out we can use carry between bits 3 and 4, which is also called half carry, to decide whether or not to do this. If half carry is clear, it means we've wrapped around this digit, and the result will be in the range of 6 to 15, 
Therefore, we need to subtract 6 to bring it back to the range of 0 to 9, which is what we want. One way to subtract 6 is actually to add A, but to ignore the carry out from the decimal adjust addition. In the second case on the right, where half carry is set, we don't actually want to do anything because the number's already in the correct range for binary coded decimal. We can do exactly the same for the top nibble when carry is clear. It'll bring this F back to a 9, and again we ignore the carry out from the decimal adjustment addition. When carry is set from the main ALU subtraction, we just add 0. This explains the hard wiring of either 0 or A in each nibble of the decimal adjust unit in the 6502 design. I add AA while blocking carry outputs from the decimal adjustment additions, and I get the result of 99, which is what I want. On the right, I add 0, so the number from the subtraction in the ALU remains the same. For binary coded decimal subtraction, the rule for the lower nibble is that if half carry is set, I add 0 without carry propagation, but if it's clear, I add A. For the top nibble, if carry is set, then I add 0. And if it's clear, I add a zero hexadecimal. This is the ALU configuration we have for the SAP 6502. Two octal D-type flip-flops receive their values from the W bus. They latch them, then present them to two 74HC181 ALU units. The ALUs then communicate the answer back to the W bus through a 74HC245. The big change I want to make now is to put another pair of adders, these 74HC283s, between the output of the ALU and the 74HC245 driving the W bus. The first thing I need to control these 283 adders is a circuit which tells us whether we're doing binary coded subtraction or not. When the subtract signal is high, that means we need to adjust for binary coded decimal in subtract mode. This takes the inverted decimal flag directly from the status register the no BCD signal and SBC bar come from the control word from the sequencer. If it and half carry are set, then I want to set bits 1 and 3 of the decimal adjust adder, which adds a hexadecimal. We do the same thing for the upper nibble, but in this case, we need to use an extra OR gate for one of the bits, which I'll explain a bit later. Subtraction is pretty straightforward, but now let's look at addition. If we add 4 and 4, we get 8 with no carry, and this is what we want. If we add 5 and 5, we get an A in hexadecimal, but there's still no half carry. This means half carry alone in this case isn't enough to help us decide what to do. We want to look at the ALU output and decide whether it's greater than or equal to 10. If it's less than 10, then we add 0. But if it's greater than or equal to 10, then we need to add 6 with carry. The reason we need carry is so that the 0a becomes a 1 0, which is what we want, 10 in decimal. We need a circuit that detects 10, but that by itself isn't enough. On the left we add 4 and 4 and we get 8, which is what we want, but on the right when we add 9 and 9, we get the output 1 2 in hexadecimal. In this case, 1 2 is incorrect, we want to add 6 to make it 1 8, which is decimal 18, the answer to 9 plus 9. What this means is we still need to use half carry from the ALU addition, as well as this circuit that detects the number greater than or equal to 10. If half carry is set, or if the ALU output is greater than or equal to 10, then we need to add 6 and propagate the carry to the decimal adjust adder for the upper nibble. We use the same hardware as we did before for binary coded decimal subtraction, but this time we have to decide whether to add 0 or add 6. If we're using binary coded decimal and the SBC signal from the sequence is not asserted, then we assume we're doing an add. I'm going to create a Carnot map for deciding whether or not to add 6. I'll provide a link to making Carnot maps below. But the basic idea is that we set up a 4x4 matrix, and this represents the 16 possible values for 4 inputs. If half carry is set, then we want to add 6. If half carry and bit 3 from the ALU are both clear, then the answer is in the range of 0 to 7, and we don't need to add 6. 
If ALU sum bit 3 is set, but S2 and S1 are clear, then the answer is 8 or 9, so we don't want to do the addition in this case either. The remaining combinations are when the lower nibble is valued A through F in hexadecimal, and for these we want to perform the addition. We can use the sum of products to derive the appropriate OR of AND's circuit. Not too complicated in this case. Here's a trick for new players. One way to implement a 4 input Carnot map is to use the 74HC151, which is an 8 to 1 multiplexer. Three of our signals select the input, in this case S2, S3, and C4. Then each pair on this Carnot map is an input to the 74HC151. Input 0 and 1 are both 0. Here's where it gets interesting. This pair contains a 0 and a 1, but this exactly mirrors S1, so we can use S1 as the third input. All of the remaining inputs are high. In this case we used S1 as an input, but sometimes we may need to use S1 bar. This is a really handy trick for four input logic. The output signal from the 74HC151 goes to bit 0 and bit 2 of the adder. Now, some of you may have noticed that this will give us a 0101 as the input to the adder, which is 5. We also connect this to the carry input, which means we end up adding 6. The lower nibble from the ALU is done, so now let's have a look at the upper nibble for binary coded decimal addition. If the carry out from the ALU is set, or the value is greater than or equal to 10, then we need to add 6 to the upper nibble. But there's also another case where the output from the ALU is 9, but we get a carry input from the lower decimal adjust adder. To handle this extra case, I'm going to use another 74HC151 in a slightly different configuration. This OR gate and ALU bit 7 detect 10 and above, while this gate detects 9 plus carry from the lower decimal bits. If our upper nibble decimal adjustment overflows, which means we get a carry out, we want the carry to be set even if the ALU itself isn't going to set the carry bit. That's what we need this AND and OR gate for. I actually built this hardware into the ALU at the start. So you can see this 74HC283 and 74HC151 here. This is for the lower nibble and this is for the upper nibble. I connected it up, and bad Pac-Man. Debugging this is going to be quite a bit more complex than the previous debug, because there's likely to be a functional problem here. That is, I'm more likely to have not implemented something correctly, or what I did implement is fundamentally flawed. i found that sometimes when you're debugging, it's just good to take a break and do something else. In this case, while I was trying to debug the circuit, my younger daughter needed to be driven to a gymnastics lesson. I did my fatherly duties, but as I was driving along, the answer popped into my head. This worked in the emulator, but I only did decimal adjustment for add and subtract in the emulator. The other ALU operations wouldn't even check the no BCD signal, but the real hardware will still do a binary coded decimal adjustment for other operations like AND, OR, and XOR. I went through the microcode and made sure that every instance of the ALU operation had no BCD asserted except for the add and subtract where I wanted them. I was able to get away with only reburning one of the EEPROMs. I really don't like cycling the chips in and out of the sockets too many times. There are a lot more of these than I thought there were. And here's the big test. Will we go from 90 to 100? Or will it go from 90 to some unusual character like the one we saw before? And there we have it. 90 went to 100. 190 goes to 200. 290 goes to 300. I'm liking this. Sorry for the glare, by the way. Unfortunately, Pac-Man doesn't use subtraction in decimal mode, so I'll have to find another way to test this a bit later. Now, our SAP6502 design has all of the features of the 6502. It's just running a bit slower. I think I'll wrap up this playlist here. Here's a sneak peek of where to from here. I'm starting a new playlist called TTL Apple 2, where I start to move the design of the SAP6502 to printed circuit boards and add a video circuit.
I'll make all the Gerbers for the printed circuit boards available, and if there's enough interest, I may look at putting a kit together at some stage. At the start, I said I wanted to muscle up the SAP-1 design, and I used the images of the Ultimate Warrior, Jesse the Body Ventura, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I thought I'd finish up with some words from Arnold for those interested in building their own CPU but can't quite pull the trigger. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. And winners will fail and get up, fail and get up, fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner.